Hello, students, and welcome to the Love School Response, confronting the myths and misinformation about relationships. Where the married and singles learn an intelligent love. One of the main problems among couples is how to raise their children. It is not always a problem, but potentially there are many problems. And we will now read the question from this student, Monica, who's very frustrated with her husband. Exactly in regards to this problem. Renato and Chris, I just don't know what to do anymore. I'm married, we have three children and a grandchild. When I get home from work, I take care of the house and the children. My husband, who works for a driving app, stays out all day long, and when he gets home, he complains about the children and me. I'm at the end of my rope. He doesn't plan anything with the family so we can go out together. And when he does, it is only to go to his family's house. <laughs> I want to go out somewhere else with our family. We have a 14-year age difference. Is this why he's like this? Hmm. A very important detail, right? Because 14 years, you know, he's, he's older, right, in this case. Yeah. And... It seems that he's much older. Usually... <laughs> there's that thing there when the person is older they start to not want to go out much they want to stay home and have peace 14 year dis difference is a lot let's say that he's 44 she's 30 right so there is you know now you're seeing the consequence of the age difference, which is a factor that many people don't really pay attention to much because they think that love is going to surpass everything. But at the end of the day, everything that complicates even more, you have to evaluate it. Age, you can't come to him that is 14 years older than you. You can't come to him and say that he has to think like you because he already went through that. It's been 14 years that he doesn't think like that. So it's not fair on your side wanting him to, to be like you, and it's not fair on his side for y him to want you to be like him. You know, he already said, you know, I already did. I, I said, and, and, and he wants to rest. So it's not fair for either one of you. So you both of you need to come to an agreement, you know, half. you both need to come halfway. Him, you know, he's going to have to sacrifice a bit for you and you're also going to have to sacrifice a bit for him so now the the thing of going out of and all of that it's also good to evaluate how the environment is at home because if you come home and you're that woman that is very stressed because you have so many things and i understand i understand that i understand your stress you have many things to be resolved, many things to clean, to organize, and you have your job, you have the children, you have so many things to do. So it's normal. And many times we have a stressful environment at home. And when your husband comes, he's complaining because he wants to come and have peace. But he doesn't have peace. Because he, there, there's a lot of things to be done. There's a lot of things to be resolved, problems to be talked about, things to be bought, thing, you know, debt to be paid, and the child complained about this at school and all, right? And she complains too. You don't make any plans for us to do something together. You have to plan something. I want to go out. And he is out the whole day long because he is a nap driver. So he is out all day and he is out all day. So it is natural that he wants to stay at home after he comes back from work. He is not that eager to go out, which is also a bit selfish of him because he goes out all the time. But you, not that much. So like Cristiani said, you have to meet in the middle. But it's important for you to understand, you both to understand the context of the situation. The situation is stressful. You have three children one grandchild he has a job that he drives around all day so when he gets home he wants quiet to rest he doesn't see himself going out any longer when he's not working but on the other hand you have your side you want to hang out 
you want oxygen and everything. It's comprehensible, but you have to try to balance things. Both of you have to try to balance things. And if he's not good at planning things, somewhere to go, a trip, etc., so you can plan, you can talk to him. Maybe you can reach a middle ground saying, you know, what do you think? Maybe we can go out once a month to do something, just us and the kids. Talk to him. What is acceptable? And if he doesn't have this initiative, you'll have it. Because it doesn't matter who plans it. The important thing is that you do something together. This that you said at the end, it doesn't matter who plans it. It's important to repeat it here because sometimes the person wants for the other one, for your spouse, you know, in, in her case, she wants him to plan it. What you really want is to go out, right? That's what you want. So it doesn't matter if it's you or him that has to, that's going to plan it. You have to, you know, simplify it. Let's make it easy. Let's see what can we do so that this that's not happening can have a bigger chance of happening. Also, because sometimes she wants him to take initiative to plan somewhere to go, and the other who is in this situation will remember an experience from the past when he tried to plan and said, let's go to that place. And she quickly said, oh no, that's boring. I don't want to go to that place. So <laughs> he gave up planning because he put an effort into planning and she criticized his choice, his decision. So if you are better at choosing places, and since you are the one who wants to go out, so take initiative. Just ask him about how he feels about that. Make it easier. If he says, yeah, we can do something once a month, good. You already have the yes. So all right, once a month you won, right? Now choose the place, talk to him so that you take the initiative. And the only thing he has to do is to get in the car and drive, which is what he does every day. <laughs> <laughs> He will become your driver. Done. Make it easier. You don't have to complicate things. Because sometimes women think, no, I wanted him to take initiative. I wanted him to take action. Because if I have to do it, it will be one more thing I have to do. And it's not coming from him or from his heart. It's not love and so on. <laughs> Let's not complicate things, right? If you want a gift, you say, look, I'm thinking about buying that for myself. Do you want to give it to me? And you go there and you buy it, right? Not Don't keep waiting for what the other person has difficulty in doing. Well, Cristiani and I spoke more about parents and children last Sunday in our lecture that we are doing on Sundays here. If you want to know more about the life of being a father or a mother, how to deal with your children, and the life of a couple as parents, Sundays at 9.30 we talk about this subject. Listen to a little bit of the lecture now. And we'll be back. We all have an inner voice. That voice that talks to us. Since the morning when the alarm clock rings, the alarm clock, and you turn it off, and the voice says to you, get up. You'll be late. You're going to be late. Right? This inner voice talks to us the whole time. Look, don't forget, you have to do that. We all have this inner voice. Only one, right? If we have more than that on Fridays, <laughs> the bishop is doing a strong work here for you that hears many voices. But I'm talking about our inner voice. The inner voice that is the voice with which we talk to ourselves. The voice that serves as a guide, conscience, direction, support. We all have this voice, the inner voice. And many studies show that the first voice, the first influence, better said, of this inner voice that we all have is the voice of our parents. The way that the mother or father talks to the child becomes the inner voice for the rest of his or her life. So, when you are a grown-up and are about to face a challenge, you go to a job interview, you go do something a bit more challenging, and you hear that voice saying, you're not able, you're not going to get it, 
Probably this voice comes from way back in the past when your parents showed doubts about your capacity. They thought you were not good enough and they verbalized it. You don't learn anything. You're dumb. You have to be more like the other kid. So our parents' voices stay with us for all of our life. And that is why fathers and mothers must observe the way they talk to their children. Because this voice stays with us every moment. Talking about the negative or the positive. Of course, no parent is so wonderful and perfect that he never said a harsh word or something that was more like him letting off some steam, showing disappointment. We have all made this mistake before. But what this cannot become is a habit, a norm, that you only talk to your child when you catch him doing something wrong. And you will criticize him, obviously. And that is the big problem because normally when children do something right, we only observe and don't say anything and think it was no more than his or her obligation. Right? Nothing more than obligation. We don't say anything. And they even think like this, if I speak, it's going to mess it up. Yeah, I won't say anything. When he is doing something right. But when he does something wrong, you speak right away. So you can imagine, parents spend most of the time criticizing, complaining, pointing out something they did wrong. Now imagine what this does in the mind of a child, a young adult, and later as a grown-up. I know that the intention is right because I already made this mistake many times with my son. You have the best intention, right? You're, you're there, you want to educate. And many times when you speak with care, they don't hear. So when you speak, you know, in a hard way, you know, criticizing, and maybe they said something, but something below the belt, right? Below the belt. And the woman, you know, she, she likes to, you know, give go under the belt because then they're going to be heard, right? So sometimes you, you do this and you're thinking, no, but my intention, it's not to, to put my son down, my child down. My intention is to help. So that's what matters. But the problem is that they don't see like this. They don't hear like this. So the more, you know, even though your intention is good, what the child, your child is feeling is that my mother, father only see bad things in me. And then you understand why many times they like to be with their friends, why they like to be outside on their cell phone, because then they, they find people that, that are going to say things that they like, you know? So don't, don't just lean on your, on your intentions. You, they can be right, but the way that you speak we're not saying that you, you can't educate your children. You have to. You need to educate your children. But you need to learn to speak in a way that they're not going to feel, you know, put down all the time. Sometimes there's sometimes things that you can, you know, that you can change, right? If you're going to talk about every little thing that they do wrong, you're going to be a, a, an unbearable person in their life. Now, your intention is not going to change that you're wanting to help. But now you're going to help in a more efficient way. And if you, like me, you already made many mistakes with this. And today, you know, you think like this, and now. I already said so many things. What do I do now? My son thinks like this. I, I see that he has this insecurity. They're, they're very needy. What do I do now? What you do is you tell them how you see them. Sometimes, perhaps you've never said it. Come to them and said, look, forgive me the times that I made you feel like this, like this, and like this. But the fact is, 
that you have the this these good qualities. So you redo that, right? You make it very clear to them. This was very important for me in my life with my son, with Renato, with my parents. When when you enforce something that you think about the person in a positive way, that helps the person a lot. One time I remember, and I'm never going to forget about this, already an adult, as an adult, I was feeling, you know, like such a bad mother. And I asked my dad for guidance. I don't know what else to do with my son. I'm a horrible mother. And he told me, no, you are the mother that your son needs. He didn't rebuke me or put me down. He gave me a word that took this weight off of me, you know? So sometimes just like the word can put someone down, a word can also lift someone up. So you can do this. You can lift your children up. You see that your, your child has this problem, that you see that, that your daughter is insecure, that they're always, you know, wanting to get into relationships, that she is always behind something. Speak to her how much, how important she is, how valuable she is. Tell her about her qualities, about her talents. This is going to help a lot. And she, she perhaps heard this from everyone, but from you, there's another weight. Because you know her. It has a completely different weight. Many people could have told me, no, you're a good mother. But when my father told me, it was an authority that there's no way to replace. It's, it's very important. The voice of father and, or the mother has a huge weight. Huge. Because when you think, if neither my father or mother sees something good about me, then who will? Who will see? So that's why it is important. I know that sometimes you have to force yourself to find something you have to put a great deal of effort to find a positive side. Because as I said, the negative is very obvious. It is much easier to notice or say to your daughter, you didn't wash the dishes like I asked. Because the dishes are there, dirty, right? Rather than when she does wash the dishes to say, you washed the dishes like I asked you. It is much easier, right? To notice when it is not done. But you have to make an effort to notice the positive. Instead of saying, your room is a mess. When he or she puts an effort, when he or she puts forth an effort, maybe they just made the bed. The room is still a mess, but the bed is made. You say, wow, you made your bed. It's better like this. You find the positive. That's how human beings work. When we receive reinforcement of something good that we do, we want to do more. Isn't this how social media works? Why so many young people are addicted to social media nowadays? Because they post a picture and someone likes it. People are addicted to likes. Yes or no? Because everyone wants to be liked. Everyone wants to have likes. But maybe if your child was a social network, you would just hit dislike, 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 dislike and then sometimes block. <laughs> is it clear? That is why God says in his word we should meditate on his word day and night. Why? Because he knows that we hear a great deal of words, and if you had a father or a mother that told you wonderful words growing up, giving thanks to God, praise God for that. But not always do we have people to say good things about us. That's why he said, meditate in my words. If you didn't have or don't have anyone to say good things to you, here, meditate in my words day and night because he doesn't say anything bad about you. Everything he says to you, to us, is to lift us up. So meditate on these words day and night. Because when we meditate in the words of God, our inner voice becomes the voice 
of the Father, God's voice, because we are always connected in His words. Amen? Did you understand? So never forget, the way you talk to your child becomes his or her inner voice. And if you understand the power of your inner voice, you will meditate on the words of God always. Because when your inner voice becomes the voice of God, you will do wonderfully in everything you do. Amen? Let's answer this question from a student. She says, I have been engaged for four months. He is very clingy, wants to see me every day and talk for the whole day. He wants me to tell him what I'm doing, what I don't do, and where I go. He keeps demanding attention and says that I'm being strange. Guys, what do I do? Many times, this stresses me out. SOS. <laughs> Look, I suggest that you read together with him the book Bulletproof Dating. The book is going to give him many tips on how this, you know, how this is not good. And for you to also see if you're really ready to be in a marriage, you know, with, with this guy. Because it seems that you are, you seem to be fed up with him and you're not even married yet. Yeah, I keep imagining she got engaged. People who get engaged are thinking about getting married. And those who think about marriage want to live together. But in your engagement, you already can't stand him. Imagine when you get married. So you really have to reevaluate the situation. Read the book the Bulletproof situation. Dating. It's going to help both of you. Both of you. And when in doubt, break up. Because if you can't stand him now, when you get married, it'll be worse. If you have a question, feel free to send it to us. And we will be back next time with more questions from our students. See you there. Goodbye. Imagine waking up one day to find that you married the wrong person, or that you lost your true love because you ruined your relationship, or that you'd missed it when that special person came into your life. For those who don't want to spend the rest of their lives regretting a bad decision, Bulletproof Dating is a must read, no matter what stage of singleness you're in. Whether you're alone, waiting, dating, picking up the pieces of your broken heart, divorced or widowed, this book will help you navigate the complicated world of modern relationships. Years of experience have given Renato and Cristiani Cardoso authority to say that most divorces start during the dating phase. Bulletproof Dating is a manual for all ages and will open your eyes and show you practical actions you can take. It's time to learn intelligent love. Ebook available on Amazon.com and other online retailers. Does your love life need a little boost? An upgrade? A complete overhaul? Worry not. We've got the right treatment just for you. It's the Love Therapy course. Live stream from Houston, Texas every Thursday at 7 p.m. Central Time with Dave and Evelyn Higginbotham, teaching practical advice for both married couples and for singles to deal with the day-to-day -day ins and outs of romance and relationship issues. If we make a mistake, it's not a problem to make a mistake, but if we make a mistake and we don't learn from it, that is... A serious problem. American culture is, you know, follow your heart. Yeah. What does your heart tell you? Don't let anybody stop you. If you love this person, don't let them stop you. You know, go for this dream that you have. That's almost elevated as this noble thing. Watch The Love Therapy live every Thursday at 7 p.m. Central Time on the Living Faith Network website. Or scroll through the archives of past love therapy sessions on ULFN.org. For more information, comments, or questions, Call 888-332-4141 or text 888-312-4141.